Yes! So this video is for photographers, designers, and digital artists. I'm focusing on the coolest features that are what's new in Photoshop 2022. And don't worry, I'll put links in the description in case you want to jump to a specific topic now or at any time. So I'm going to be covering the object selection tool, which now lets you automatically have selections on hover. I'm going to talk about the new sky replacement updates and how you can add your own skies. And even better, how you now have five sky packs that you can pull in that you'd never had in the past year that this was released. And they've improved the oil paint filter. They've re-implemented the GPU-based oil paint filter for both Mac and Windows, which essentially means you get live, on-demand, interactive configuration. And now we have new and improved neural filters, which are powered by Adobe Sensei, which is an artificial intelligence, and it brings new and improved reimagined filters that lets you explore a whole range of creative ideas. The top three, the landscape mixer, lets you create a new landscape by mixing different landscape images together. The color transfer creatively transfers a color palette from one image to another. And harmonization harmonizes the color and luminosity of one layer to another layer to make a flawless composite. But the thing that they've done to the colorize filter, which we've had for a year now, is simply amazing. I'm going to show you some real world applications of how to use this filter in a way that it wasn't intended to be used. With this new camera raw update that came along with Photoshop 2022, masking has been reimagined where you can now organize local adjustments in a new masks list and you can combine multiple tools to create more complex and precise selections. They've even given us a select subject and select sky button, which we've had now for a while in Photoshop, but now we have it in Adobe Camera Raw. And they've given us eight new sets of premium presets, which is simply amazing. They're basically pulling over a lot of that Lightroom functionality over into Adobe Camera Raw. And they've also given us a preset amount slider, which allows us to fine tune the presets impact on your photo. Now, the way I try to approach this is not just showing you something in 10 seconds and saying this is the new technique. What I've tried to do is give, give you real world case studies that have two to three to four images, how I would apply each of these changes and, and all the little nuances to think about, hopefully inspiring your creativity. I can't wait to see the work that you make because this is awesome. So let's go see what's new in Photoshop 2022. Yes! So the object selection tool in Photoshop 2022 has had some amazing improvements. When you come over and select it right here, and I draw a box around this guy, it's gonna snap to him. If I go into my select and mask, you'll see there's some little yellow right around the hair. I'm just gonna hit refine hair. And look what it did. It fixed all the hair. It even came into some transparency inside of the sunglasses. So I can output that to a new layer with layer mask and click okay. Turn back on the background layer. And now what if I want to shift the color of this whole background image? Let me select it, add a hue saturation adjustment. I like the orange. And then I can just go grab another image like this one, click, hover over the tab, come down inside, let go, and then I'll pull it down below that adjustment layer. Since this is being applied to the background, I'm just going to choose overlay and maybe a lower percentage so it's not so... Yeah, I really like where we're going with this. Some other tweaks. Well... How about the fact that I can't see, I see yellow here. So I need to tweak that a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on this mask with the guy. Hit B for brush, smaller brush, and I'll just paint in here. So to pick up the color from underneath where we had some of that orange overlay. Just to kind of blend it with the scene a bit more. And I feel like he could be a bit more dramatic. So let's select him. He's on the top here, but he's masked out. So I can go into the camera raw filter and adjust him. Remember, showing me everything because it doesn't show the mask. But I'm going to pull up the clarity a bit, open up this to make it a little brighter, and just click OK. And there we go. So we've gone from this to this, like a whole design package, really fast and, and pretty dramatic. Bang, bang, baby. It's a new day. First, let's go select the object selection tool. And remember, this is the one where if you draw a box around any subject, it's going to figure it out and snap to it. And you still have the power of going up to select and mask. I'm going to use command or control spacebar so I can zoom in using this second one, this refine edge brush tool, just to tell it, hey, don't forget to get this. 
Ah, oh, look at that halo. Do you see that little halo right there? I'm gonna show you how to fix that, which I notice sometimes does happen with this object selection tool. So I always like my smart radius to be about one pixel, smoothing one in feather 0.4, everything else is default. And I'll always output to new layer with layer mask. Click OK, command zero to fit in screen. Now remember, it always just automatically turns off the layer behind it. So I just turn that back on. Now remember that halo I was talking about? You can always look at your mask by holding down the Alt on Windows or Option on Mac key and click on it. Ah, there we go. I'm gonna zoom back in real quick. Do you see this halo that's going all the way around? A quick way to fix that, just go to your brush tool, toggle black in your foreground and change your mode at the top all the way down to overlay. Because overlay is about enhancing contrast. It's about getting rid of gray. So notice how my main selection of the guy, white reveals. So the white is 100% white, then there's black, then there's this little gray jaggy halo. So as long as I'm painting with black, if it's not 100% white, it's gonna shift over to 100% black. And that's what we wanna do. So I'm just gonna clean up that mask real quick, going all the way around the perimeter of the guy. I want that to be white. So I'm gonna switch my foreground back to white because I wanna switch this to white. See how I clean that up? And then I'll turn my eyeball back on and there we go. Command zero to fit in screen. And again, remember this object selection tool works on like say this giant rock. See how it snapped all the way down to the rock so I could click on the levels adjustment layer if I wanted to make that rock a little darker because it was too overexposed. Now notice I'm still getting that little halo again which I, I've noticed is a remnant of this object uh, selection tool. However, you always need to tweak your mask. Here's another quick way to tweak a mask. While you're on the mask, see how it's most highlighted with those white corners? Just go up to filter, down to other, down to minimum, and you're going to change your preserve to a roundness. It converts these from whole numbers to decimals, giving you more control. And then you see how you can just kind of drag it until you see that disappear. That's a quick way to adjust your mask. That's what we know already about the object selection tool. Let me show you the new feature. So looking at this image, if I wanted to select the individual strawberries, I'd have to do the quick selection tool and paint over each one and then refine my mask. But watch this. When I toggle on the object selection tool, the objects finder up here is automatically checked and it automatically starts looking to find the objects in your image. And it's already found them all. So now I just hover over them. It's found this strawberry, it's found this strawberry, it's found this strawberry, this strawberry, this strawberry. Do you see what it's done? It's pre-selected every object or at least the primary objects in the scene ready to go. So all you have to do is click on it. It activates that selection. And then let's say I wanted to add a hue saturation adjustment because I want to change the color of my strawberry. See how it added the mask automatically because that we had an active selection. Now I can change this to say magenta. Go back to my background layer and I can click on this one and choose a hue saturation layer again and change this one to green. And then I can go back to my background and I can choose this one and I'll hold down the shift key and select that one. So I selected two that time, hue saturation. Can we make those blue? Yeah, there's a blue. So you see how it's given you a lot of immediate and powerful control, but it's still fully editable. So do you see how this little area right here, it got just a tiny part of that bottom strawberry? I'm just gonna hit B for the brush. I'm going to find that particular, see there's the eyeball for it. That's how I verify. I'm on the layer mask. I am painting with black in my foreground. My mode needs to be on normal at 100%. And what that's gonna do, right bracket key to go a little bigger, let me tweak that mask. And if for some reason I didn't want this strawberry in the back to be green, I just find that mask, which is right here. Nope, it's this one right here. And I'm just gonna clean that mask up because I only want that front one to be green. Go back to the object selection tool. And look, it found the basket. So if I want to select the basket, add a levels adjustment layer, it automatically masks everything but the basket, allowing me just to put a little density into that basket. Now, some things to think about. You can come up to this gear icon and you can change your default color of the overlay to whatever you want. The default outline is zero and it's 65% opacity for that color overlay. I like to leave mine on auto refresh. And then you can also toggle this on, which will show you every single thing it chose. I don't need it to show me all the objects. I just like to hover over them and then it will show me as I need it. See how that works? Really cool. 
So now with the sky replacement feature, you can take your drab images and add whatever skies that you want. It'll mask out for you automatically and it lets you explore very quickly between all the different new packs that are wildly free and you can import your very own personal images. Yes! So first I always like to hit Command or Control J just to duplicate my layer. So I always have a, the original to go back and take a look at. So this shot, it's a little crooked and obviously if I'm using this for promotional material it looked kind of drab because it was kind of a drab overcast kind of a, a gray day. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pop over to filter camera raw filter. I'm going to go over to the geometry tab and I'm just going to say hey could you straighten that up automatically. Looks great. Go back to the basic tab and as we're looking at this I'm thinking you know let's just go ahead and, and give it a little bit of a, a, a brightening from right here a touch of clarity and a little more vibrance. I'm going to click OK and that's where I'm starting to work. Now I want to replace that sky. So I go over to edit, down to sky replacement, and I need to find a happy sky. How's that one? Pretty nice, that's pretty bright. The way to get rid of this little mini dialog box is just click on the background, see how that worked? Now if I pull the lighting adjustment all the way over, it's gonna really contaminate my subject because it wants to blend in the color of the sky with the subject. I don't want that. I want there to be a nice separation. So I'm gonna pull the lighting adjustment the other way. Same with the color adjustment, pull the lighting adjustment back just a little and I'll click okay. And what it's gonna do, if you've used this filter before, is it puts all the masks and all the adjustments inside of a folder called sky replacement group. I'll toggle that down so it's not so cluttered. Take a look. Overall, I'd say it did a pretty good job putting in that nice brighter sky. I think what I would want to do though is while I'm on this layer is I would go ahead and go over to the object selection tool, see how it's looking. Let's see if it finds the castle. It found the castle, at least most of it. So I'm going to hit uh, the shift key and select the parts that it didn't select. And I'll toggle over to select and mask just to refine that selection a little bit. With the second brush, which is the refine edge brush, that allows me to like get this little bit of right bracket key to make my brush bigger. Get this little bit of sky that's inside here. Get this little bit of sky here. It doesn't have to be perfect. This is not a selection video, but I'm just doing some basic tweaking. I'll go ahead and paint over all this to let it figure out what's the sky and what's the, the bush. That'll be good enough. I'm gonna output with a new layer with layer mask, turn this back on, and I'm gonna pull this above the sky replacement group. See how that made them just a little brighter. So now I can make that sky a little brighter, something like that. And I can still tweak this guy. And what I think I would do is, quite honestly, is I go to filter, stylize, down to oil paint, just to break up a little bit of the detail, which will then allow me to go in and just pull the saturation up just a touch. Because remember, this is a Disney Magic Kingdom. I'll Command Option Shift Letter E to push all those adjustments to the very, very top layer. I'll go over to Filter, Camera Raw, and just make some last tweaks. Open up the shadows. Again, make sure it's bright and kind of glowy, like an illustration, and click OK. You see how you can quickly replace the sky. So let's switch to this image. And I want to replace the sky, but let me show you a different thing that wasn't available until 2022. Click on Sky Replacement. Come down to, and this is amazing, click on the gear icon and choose Get More Skies. Adobe set it up so you can download a whole new sky pack than you've had for the past year. Download free skies. Ready? It's going to take me to the Adobe Creative Cloud Marketplace where there's free assets. You can watch this video to learn how to add skies to your collection that you can swap out whenever you want. There's a whole collection of sunsets. There's a whole new spectacular one. There's night skies even, which is a whole new category. There's blue skies and there's storms. So let's play Adobe's video. Once you've activated the find sky replacement, you click on that gear icon, you get a choice and you just click get more skies and then download them. It takes you to a website and you get to download all of them for free, which is amazing. Then you just go back to that gear icon and this, this time you just choose get more skies, but import presets, or you can just drag and drop everything that you've downloaded into Photoshop. So let me show you real time. So I'm open the sky replacement feature. I'm clicking the gear icon. I'm getting more skies and importing the presets. It's gonna navigate automatically to your presets folder, but you've got to go to wherever you drug them when you downloaded them and you just shift click on every single one of those sky files and it auto loads them. Let me close the original ones by clicking that disclosure triangle. So now I have all the new sky packs. Let's take a look at them. Look at that. Oh, that's amazing. Holy moly, Batman. That is awesome.
I know, right? Let's get back to the lecture. So we have all these new sky packs. I wonder what storms looks like. Hmm, got some good stuff. A little lightning in the background, nice and dramatic. So this is really exciting, but you can also get more skies and import your own skies, which you couldn't do before. So see, I can select this, click open, and now I have my own personal sky that I can bring into this image. Bang, bang, baby. It's a new day. Yes! Speaking of creativity, let's talk about the improvements to the oil paint filter. Yes! They've created it so that it accesses your GPU so you get live, interactive, immediate feedback on what you're doing. So if you don't know how to apply this, let me show you. I'm gonna hit Command or Control J to duplicate my layer over here so I'm not working on the original layer. And then I think I actually wanna separate the squirrel from the background so I can manipulate them individually. I'm gonna click on the object selection tool see if it finds it. See, it's still looking. It's going to figure out where everything is. Okay, it found my squirrel. It didn't do anything with the background, but it did find my log. Okay, good. Well, then I'll separate it to the squirrel, the log, and the background. So to activate a selection with the object selection tool, just click on it, and you see those marching ants? Then I'll come up to select and mask, see how it did around the hair. It didn't do bad, but it didn't do great, but we have this refine hair button that will refine around that hair. Watch this, look, is that not amazing? And then I'll come back in with the traditional quick selection tool, make my brush a little bigger with the right bracket key. And it's like, I know I want all of that. Remember, it's AI learning, it's AI intelligence. So the more you tweak it, the more passes it's gonna make and try to figure out what it is you want. And then I can use this refine edge brush, the one that's right up here in the far left corner. And then I'm just gonna say, you know, I think there's more hair in here. Make sure you get all of it. And I definitely think there's more whiskers. Yeah, look at all those whiskers. Make sure you get all those whiskers. Remember, I like to set my radius somewhere between one and four. That looks nice. Smooth it, feather it between one or so. Feather, I always do less than a pixel. And I'm going to output this new layer with layer mask. So now I have my squirrel all by himself. Now I'm going to turn on this back layer, go back to the background, and I'm going to hover over the stump. Click it to activate it. I'm just gonna double check it in the select and mask so that it's not near as complicated as the other one. And I'll just get an output that to its own layer mask. So notice what I've done. I now have the squirrel by itself, I have the stump by itself, and then I have the background and the squirrel by themselves. Now, what I could do, and you don't have to do this, but what I could do is click on the squirrel mask, hold the shift key, command or control click on the tree stump mask. See how it selected, it intersected and added both of those selections together. I'll go up to select, down to modify and expand and maybe nine pixels. See how it went further around? Probably needs to be bigger than that. So I'll do select, modify, expand. And in this case, I'll maybe do 20 more pixels just because of the stray hairs. There we go. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go to edit, fill and I'm going to choose content aware and say, get rid of the squirrel and the log. I just want a clean background. I just want a plate. Okay, it didn't do a great job. It didn't do bad, I D. So now what do I do? I have a lot of options. I probably just come to the patch tool, make a big circle of just a chunk of that, drag it over and say, replace that. And then replace that. And then replace that. So what did I just do? I just gave myself a nice clean background for this squirrel to be on. So now I have 100% control. So I'll click on the squirrel. I'll go to filter, down to stylize, over to oil paint. And now it's, see how it's instant. I drag this over to stylization. Do you see how it makes instant updates? Let me zoom in a bit. So I'll change the stylization. Now, one of the reasons the oil filter, the oil paint filter gets such a bad name is because of this lighting is typically checked. And that is trying to cast a shadow from the actual brush strokes if this were actually oil paint on a canvas. But I find that it tends to ruin the effect for me. So I, I typically just toggle that off and I play with my bristle detail and I play with my stylization. And the way to do it is max each one out. And that's gonna show you what they're doing. So I'll pull down the bristle tail, detail. Okay, so it looks like what? Looks like most of the manipulation to this image is happening with the stylization and the cleanliness. So those are the two most powerful sliders. So I'm gonna click okay, and that's pretty harsh, right? But what do I have? I have my original squirrel down here. If I ever need to go back down to him, I can do that. But I'm not gonna worry about that for now. Click command zero. Okay, I like that. I'm going to click on the stump, and now I'm gonna go apply the oil filter to just the stump. Remember, if you choose the very first filter, that's the last application you did. So this would be that intensity of oil paint applied, which I don't want to duplicate, right? I want a lesser effect of oil paint. So what I'm gonna do 
is I'm going to pull down this and this because I don't want this to be that distracting. Pull it down, pull it down, pull the stylization down. Do you see how that's much more minimal down here? I'll click OK. And now the background. Let's oil paint the background and see how that does. By separating the subject and the stump from the background, I've given myself total control over each of the independent elements in the scene. I recommend you do this whenever you can. And see here, I'm going to really jack it up. And because it's a super soft, blurry background, it does very, very little. Now watch this. Now I'm going to double click the property so it'll collapse so I can see what I'm doing. I want to push all of this up to the top by hitting Command Option Shift Letter E or Control Alt Shift Letter E. So I can now select my three separated subjects. Hit Command or Control G, put them in a group, turn them off. So I went from here, which is a really nice shallow depth of field shot, isolating the subject of the squirrel, to making it more of an illustration. But if I didn't like that eye, because that's a little too much, I can add a layer mask, hit B for the brush, left bracket key to make my brush a little smaller, and paint back in that regular eye. And then I can tap 2 for 20% in case... Some of this is a little too intense. Some of this is a little too stylized for me. So here and there, yeah, dude, stylized? How about it looks freaking ridiculous? Soften that up a bit, dude, soften it up. I can go in and paint back in a little bit of that detail that if it's bothering me, that it looks a little too painted. Do you see how that's a nice integration? Then I can push all of that to its own layer, Command, Option, Shift, Letter E. And now I'm gonna go over to Camera Raw for my branding editing. This is where I want to put my touches. Definitely want a little bit of clarity, great chance for some saturation. I think this will be a happier, more brighter image, something like that. Would I worry about the shadow detail? I think that's that's a wonderful way to go. How high can I pull that? See, I don't want your eyes to bleed, right? Saturation will make your eyes bleed. Vibrance tends to only make the color channels brighter, more saturated than need it. So I'm going to pull that up to there. I'm going to pull up the dehaze to saturate it a bit more, make it look a little darker, and I'm going to click OK. Now, generally, I like to go too far. OK, I think we made a lot of nice improvements to that to make it really jump off the page. But you can always lower the opacity to mix the two if you want to. You can actually duplicate this layer and choose a blend mode to exaggerate the effect that you just did, like overlay, which will add a lot of contrast and color. And in particular with that overlay blend mode, if you were to go up to filter down to blur and Gaussian blur, you can kind of drag in a more of a dreamy effect of the application. Now again, Photoshop does everything at 100%. If it looks too crazy, which it may, just pull down the saturation a touch. And if it really oversaturated it, you know what to do. Just grab that hue and saturation adjustment layer and pull the saturation down just until it looks nice to you. I'm now going to select every single thing we've done from top to bottom by shift clicking on the top and bottom layer, clicking command or control G, turning it off. Here's where we started. Here's where we ended up. That looks really exciting. So the new landscape mixer in the neural filters is amazing. Imagine looking at this image and saying, hey, I'd like to make it a bit more green and springy, or maybe I'd like to make it look more meadowy and summery, or make it look like a desert. I can take this image and totally change it. The new landscape mixer is simply amazing. Let me show you how it works. Yes! So I'm going to go up to filter, down to neural filters. It's going to open up this large dialog box because Smart Portrait is automatically chosen. It's saying, hey, new faces were detected, which is fine. So I want to use the landscape mixer. Remember, you have to toggle them on and then you can apply any of these presets over here, which is really amazing. Like if, if I say, hey, this is like kind of wintry, but I want it to be more wintry. I just click this and you'll see it's processing on the device. And then I get something that's a little bit more wintry. Now I have the ability, I can hit this reset icon and it will go back to the what it was before. Or I could just scroll down, it's like, oh, how about this wintry scene? Maybe make it look more wintry and a little more rocky. And there you go. Now what if I said, you know, I like where this is going, but I, I think I want it to look more springy. So I'm just going to click that and look at that. I mean, that looks really realistic. And then if I say I want it to be all covered in grass, I don't want any blank spots, I don't want the rocks, then I'll apply this one. See, this landscape mixer does a really good job a lot of the time. Now, sometimes it doesn't. 
I'll apply this desert scene. Like I want it to look more like a desert, orangey and sandy. And look, it does it. Now, one of the things I've noticed is when you apply these, sometimes in the blue sky, you get this real grainy looking effect, which I don't enjoy. And some of these just won't line up at all. But that's okay. Experiment, figure out which ones are, are good for you if, with the images you shoot. I'm gonna click okay on that one. Six and a half hours later. And what I've done is I've toggled over to where I've applied several of the neural filters to this particular image. So I could just toggle through them very quickly for you. So here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. And you can see that grain I was just talking about. Now what's interesting is I'll just click and drag on the eyeballs, turn everything off but the original. I'll select that original. So I know you know how to go to edit and go down to sky replacement that they came out with last year. I show you in this video series how to download all these new sky packs so you can basically apply any sky you want. And it's very quick with the new GPU processing. So I'm going to click cancel to get out of that. Because again, I've already done it. So I can just turn on that sky replacement group. Remember, it loads everything as its own group in a folder with all of the masks for this particular image. So I can very quickly turn on, okay, that's a more spectacular sky. Then I can cycle through my options to see which one I like the best. I can turn that sky off. I can turn on this sky. Looks like that one's going to work really good with that dark sandy one, right? And then I can turn on, I'd have one more sky in here. It's just more of a bluer sky. And I actually like that sky a lot better than the original sky. It fills up the space more. It's brighter. I think it looks really nice. But again, I can just toggle through all of my new landscape foregrounds and see how that sky integrates with them. Do you see what I mean? You have so much variability in what you can do now. So let's take this image. I'll go over to filter, neuro filter, turn on the landscape mixer. So starting here, if I wanted it to look more like a daytime shot and also have a bit more greenery, I'll start with this image and see how that one got rid of all of the water. And then I'll try this third one. I like that one the best. I think that's pretty dramatic. You also have the ability to check preserve subject and that's gonna find the most important part of the image and it's gonna mask it out, which I think usually does it too severely. Yeah, see that's, a whole different background and now it's just the original image. A lot of times you can click harmonize subject and it will try to blend it but not as strong but I still find that it doesn't work as well. So for what I like to do in those situations is I'll just uncheck those. I'll get something I like. I'll click OK. Remember it's going to be output to its own layer. Everything's already applied on one layer and then what I'll do is I'll go back to the background maybe select subject just select this area here tweak the mask a little bit. You get the idea. You can make your mask however you like. I'll, out, I'll put that to a new layer, layer mask, and I'll pull it above what we did, right? And then what I'll do is I'll go back to that layer mask with a brush and just custom 50%. Notice my opacity is up here. And I'll just custom blend in where I liked what it did. And the more I keep applying it, 50% on top of 50%. I can very quickly paint in where exactly I, I want the greenery to be growing. Maybe I want all of this to be kind of green, overtaking the actual castle. Maybe I'll hit zero for 100% because I really want it to encapsulate all of this. So remember, when you get back to the original image, you always have the ability to mask back in some part of this that you want whatever part that may be. But notice how good of a job it did converting a night scene to a day scene with lots of foliage, because that's what I chose. Let's take this image and show you another use of the neural filters. Let's just look at this and say, you know, overall, turn on landscape mixer. I would like this to be more in autumn. I want all those yellowy green leaves. I want it to be, look more like fall. Now notice what it does. It's actually going to recompute the entire image, which obviously has some post-processing to strip out all color in these rocks and water. So they're more black and white with just the yellow. And look at what it did. I'm going to click OK. And all I did was drag the autumn slider to 100%. Notice what it did. Look at the water right down here. It created rocks underneath the water and it put lichen and fallen leaves on the rocks themselves. Now it followed a lot of the architecture of the rocks underneath, but it created new rock architecture based on Adobe Sensei and the millions of images it's looking at to process this. Now, as I look at this, I think, well, you know, that 
it looks a little flat to me now. So I would actually open up this image back in Camera Raw and make my own adjustment since it looks a little flat. I pull up the dehaze and the clarity. That's going to give me some uh, mid-tone contrast and make things just a touch darker. Maybe pull up the blacks a touch, open up the shadows a touch, maybe make it overall a bit brighter and maybe warm it up just a touch. Pull that exposure back down and then I'll click OK. And wherever it doesn't look right based on my photographic knowledge, like in here, these areas should be totally black, right? They're in the deepest crevices, but they're not rich in black. So you, you may have to go back in. I'll choose the burn tool. I'll choose shadows. And typically 10% is a great thing to start out with shadows. Right bracket key for a bigger brush. Because right in here, I'll click and click and click. Because I know right in here should have a rich D max. Same for right in here. Maybe somewhere in here, we've got a little mist. And that's going to also give it some inherent contrast that makes the image look a bit more, you know, believable kind of passing over everything that looks like it's a little flat. We had this image and then we just said, make it 100% more fall. And this is what it came up with. And that's not bad. So color transfer is a new neural filter and it has a lot of creative applications where you can take an image and quickly apply many different presets that are already loaded into the feature panel. Now I know Adobe is going to upgrade this and add a lot more, but you can also customize it and maybe match a color from this image to this image. Yes! So color transfer is a pretty powerful neuro filter. Let's go over to filter neuro filters. So if I just choose color transfer, so here I can pick any of these preset photographs and it's going to kind of load the colors on it. Like here's just a black and white high contrast. Here's blues. So it's taking the colors of these images and applying them to whatever image you want. Here's like a sepia vintage look, more of a purpley look, yellow look. So you see how there's a lot of power there and I can always, you know, brighten it up if it went a little crazy and pull up the luminance to get the contrasty look that I'm looking for. And that's great, right? That's really fun and creative. But check this out. Let's say I have a photo shoot and here my white balance was perfect ready to go. But then I went by a different window light and I didn't check my color temperature or my white balance settings. And all of a sudden I've got this whole series of images that don't have this really nice warm tint. Well, watch this. I just select that image, go to filter, neuro filters. I'll go down to color transfer. And then instead of the presets, I'm going to choose custom and I'm going to go down to select an image. And it's basically looking at any images I have open in Photoshop. So this is the image that I need, the 173. It's going to show it to me and then it's going to apply it. Look at that. Look how great of a job it did. I can bring up that brightness just a touch. Click OK. So before and after. And then let me pull this down so you can see. Do you see how it got it in the ballpark? I'd say it's a little too saturated, but it got it so quickly in the ballpark. So let's say you spent a lot of time creating a look, but you didn't save it as a preset, but you want to apply that whole color and tone to a very similar image. So essentially just go up to filter, neuro filter. And again, you're going to go over to the color transfer, turn it on. And this time, instead of using a preset, you're going to use custom and you're going to find that image that's already open in Photoshop. Here it is. It's going to show it to me and it's going to apply it automatically. See processing on device. And it did a really good job. If I need to preserve the luminance, I can toggle that on. And I think that did a wonderful job. Click OK. So for just a quick pass, it went from this more cool neutral image to this warm one that's very similar to this one. The new neural filter called Harmonization is great for color matching two different images together. Let me show you how. Yes! We've all been in the situation where we're compositing and we've got to match the color temperature to the other scene. So I want to put these birds in this boat scene. Well, first let me select them and I'll use that new object selection tool, right? It's going to look automatically because object finder is automatically checked. See how it's spinning? It's trying to figure out the objects in my scene. It quits spinning once it's done. And then, well, there you go. It's found this one, this one, this one, and this one. There's a hover over them, you can tell. So I'm going to click and then I'll hold the shift key and click on that one and hold the shift key and click on that one. And then what I want to do is let's just go to select and mask. I hold down the command and spacebar simultaneously to zoom in a bit. So I don't like that little halo, but I'm going to show you how to get rid of it. First, I'm going to output it to a new layer with layer mask. Click OK. I'm going to command or control zero to fit in screen. And I'm going to alter option click on that mask. And I'm going to zoom back in manually. So one of the things I can do is choose the brush tool, choose overlay blend mode, paint with black, and anything that's not 100% black will go black. But if it's 100% white, it's going to stay white. 
You see how this one get rid of that halo? Because that halo was gray. So I'm getting rid of that, cleaning up my mask. And I'm going to pan around because I think there were some more. These aren't that bad, maybe because they're so far away. That one's not that bad. Command zero. So what I'm going to do is just open this back up. I'm going to pull this over to this layer, V for the move tool. And let's say I'll put that bird right there and I'll duplicate the layer, hit command T, command zero to fit everything in screen because I couldn't even see the corners here to shrink this down. And so now I'll shrink this down and try to position it so these birds are flying over here. Right away, I see that I don't like that bird, so I'm gonna get rid of it. And the way I'm gonna get rid of it is, is hit the B key and I'm on the layer mask, right? It's the most selected, right bracket key for bigger brush, and I'm just going to mask that bird out. If your tool doesn't work the way you think it should, check your toolbar. Ah, I need to be painting with normal at 100%. And now it should just totally go away. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to command E, which is going to say, what do you want to do if you're merging these two layers? And I'm going to say, well, apply the layer mask. And it, what it did is it threw away my layer mask. But do you notice how the color of the bird doesn't quite match this cool color? All I've got to do is go over to filter, neuro filters. I'm going to choose harmonization and I'm going to select the layer. I want the background layer and look at the birds once it's processing on device. Do you see how it made them more cool? Let me pull this over on this side. I can raise the strength to 100 so you can see what it does to them then. And I can adjust the different colors, the saturation and the brightness, but it tries to match them for me. And I put it on its new layer. Here's where we were. Do you see how the birds have kind of a yellow tinge and now they have a darker, more blue tinge? That's what it does is it tries to blend the images based on color and tone. So in this video, I'm going to show you the new colorize filter in the neural filters area that has been crazy updated. I'm going to show you this rose. It figured out the color by itself. It figured out this was a flamingo. But how about this black and white portrait shot? It did a wonderful job. But it also figured out this landscape shot. And then I put two guys together and it still did what it's supposed to do. But what about this? What about crazy color corrections to make this image look like this one? And I'm going to show you how right now. Yes! Let's take this black and white image over to the new neural filter. We've had a lot of these since the past year. Ah, but notice I can't colorize it. Why is that? Well, let me X out. If you look over here, do you see how this says gray 8-bit? Essentially, the mode of this image is grayscale. So I need to come up to image, mode, and RGB color. Still going to stay black and white, but now I have three color channels. Now I can go into filter, down to neural filter, and you'll see that my colorize is not grayed out. So if you ever encounter that, just probably your, your image is in grayscale mode. You have to click these to turn them on and then it applies. Now, one of the things that's interesting, it kind of figured out that this was a rose and gave it a pinkish color and it gave the background that's all blurry a nice green color. I mean, it did a really good job using the artificial intelligence called Adobe Sensei and machine learning. But here's the newer feature. If I want to click, like, let's see how this area right here didn't make it very well. If I want to click inside that area, like right there, it's going to open up a color picker and I can choose a really bright red, click OK, and it's going to put red there. And I can just keep doing this. Like if I want it more red on the outside, if I want to see right down here, it's kind of bright. If I want it more red here on this one, on this one, on this one. How about on the inside? How about we do a red on the inside? and everywhere it looks like the color didn't quite get right. So do you see how we're able to custom tweak this as much as we want? This little area right here, I can click. So I get to custom choose, that little center part looks a little black and white. So I'm gonna click again as close as I can get there. So do you see that? How powerful is that? And you also have the ability to rate it. And if you click yes, you're gonna be prompted to give feedback on you know what could they do to make it better or what did you like about it? So it's really a nice interactive area. And once you're done, just click OK. And it will apply those changes on its own layer. See, it went from this to this really quickly. Let me show you another function of this tool. So I'm starting out with this black and white portrait. I'm going to go to Filter, Neuro Filters. I'm going to choose Colorize by turning it on. Notice it put a blue box around the face. It has automatic face recognition software. I'm going to turn it on. Next, I'm going to pull this to this side. And look at that. It did a really good job just straight out of the can and figured out what to do where. So I like that green background. I think I'll put a little bit more green back in here. And remember, you do that by just clicking. It's going to open up the color picker. And I want some kind of a green, but not an intense green. 
Maybe something like that. Nope, that's too blue. So if that's too blue, let me pull it down to more yellow and lighter. There we go. See, so I have that nice green. And now I can keep that color and just put more green wherever I think I want it in the background, maybe up in this corner. Whenever I like what's going on and I'm done, I just click OK. It did really good. But how will I do on this landscape? Let's take a look. Filter, Neuro Filters. It's going to open up. I'm going to toggle it on. I'm going to always leave check the auto color image because it's going to do that work for you. I was like, OK, this actually this looks really interesting, but I don't think that road should be that red. So I'll click inside there and I'll pick more. Actually, I, I want to go more blue, but more of a blue gray. See how that looks. That was perfect. And then this blue area back here, I think, is a little odd. So maybe I'll click there and it applied that gray again, which actually I don't mind. But you can always drag a slider just to tint that a little bit. If I wanted a little more green, notice how it's tinting everything green. So I think that did a really good job straight out of the can for a custom colorized black and white image. Flamingo. Now we all know what color flamingos are. Filter, newer filter. But here's the thing. Adobe Sensei is going to know too because it's looked at 10 million flamingo pictures. Look at that. How great did it do with me giving it zero input? Click OK. But let's see how it does with these two guys. Filter, newer filter, colorize. That is really not bad at all. If I don't like this red in the background, remember I just click in that background. Maybe I want it to be more blue. Click OK once I pick a blue. And remember, I can click more spots. Maybe I want to click beside the, under the guy's arm here. Maybe on this side. Maybe his face on each side. Now, maybe his face is a little wrong. So how about I click his face and then I click on that color icon because I want to pick a different face color. How about that? It's too dark. So lighter, more orange, something like that. Is that more flesh toned? I'm getting there, right? Not quite there. But do you see how quickly I'm getting to where I need to be just with these little tweaks? So for a quick color correction, it's doing really good. Artists always take a tool that was meant to be used one way and they figure out some other creative way to use it. Take a look at this image. Now, let's say you're shooting something with like a magenta light on one side and a blue light on one side. You get these great shots, but all of a sudden you want to take, you like that pose, but you don't want that creative lighting. You just want it to be a normal photograph. Well, watch what it does to this. Neuro filters, colorize. Look at that. It took this really blue tinted, really cool preset look and converted it to just a normal photograph. Now, again, if I don't like this little blue right here, I just click on that little part of the hat. It's going to open up the color picker. If I want some kind of a brown, maybe click OK and it put brown through there. And maybe I want brown up here too. See how it made her a whole hat brown. And maybe that, do you see that how this is highlighted with the blue ring around it? Maybe I wanna go in and say, you know, make that a lighter brown at the top of the hat. Well, that made it more saturated. I don't like that. So we go to the left to desaturate, see how this looks. So do you see how you have control over all these areas? It figures out what it needs to do for you. So this I think is a really exciting component an interesting way to use this tool that it, in a way that it wasn't meant to be used. So Adobe Camera Raw 14.0 that came out with Photoshop 2022 did some revolutionary things. They totally reimagined masking, adding so much control that typically you would only have inside of Photoshop because essentially they've figured out a way to change the way your local adjustment tools and workflows work in Adobe Camera Raw because you can now combine mask tools and you can select specifically color and luminance. Let's check that out. Yes! So I have this image. I'm gonna open it in Adobe Camera Raw by clicking on this little icon up here or I could hit Command R on a Mac or Control R on Windows. I'm gonna open up the Adobe Camera Raw dialog box and we have this new icon over here. And now remember, Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom have the exact same processing engine. So the develop module in Lightroom has the exact same algorithmic functionality that Adobe Camera Raw has. It just depends on which platform you enjoy working in. So I'm going to click on this masking icon and look what we have now. We have a select subject, which we've never had before. We have a select sky, uh, which we never had before. And now each of these tools, the brush, the linear gradient, the radial gradient, we can now select based on color range alone. 
and we can base our changes on luminance alone. And it gives you a quick little demo of what each does in case you forget. So let's try the select subject. And inside of Adobe Camera Raw, it's gonna figure it out, mask it. I can always change my mask color by clicking here if I need to, so I can see what's being masked. And that's perfect. So now when I start to drag this adjustment, the mask will disappear so I can see what I'm adjusting. So I definitely think she should be brighter, but unfortunately when you brighten up underexposed subjects, it tends to flatten them. You're missing, you know, those rich blacks. So I need to add the rich blacks back in there just to make it look correct. I'll pull down the highlights. I think that's really strong. I, I really like the direction that went. But here's what you can also do. Go back to that mask icon, come down to select color range, and then let's select this little area by clicking and dragging. It picked up her face, which we don't like. It picked up over here. So what if I wanna subtract, but using the brush? I'll hit the right bracket key to make my brush bigger, because I wanna take that off of her face. I don't want it to affect any of that. I really want it just to affect her hair. This is reflected light here. And then I can paint out everything on the brick that I don't want it to contaminate, because it just happens there's red in the red brick, obviously and I don't want to affect her skin tone. There's some reflected light going on there. So you see you have a lot of quick control inside Adobe Camera Raw, and now I can just grab the hue slider, say make that dress maybe this color red. So you have a lot of powerful control with the masking, and you still get to go back and say, hey, I always like a little bit of extra clarity. I like to make my scenes a little dark. I love to bump up the vibrance a little bit while I pull down the saturation. For my brand, I always put a bit of a vignette to keep people focused on the image. And I think that's a, a really quick and strong way to edit in Adobe Camera Raw. I'm gonna click done. It's gonna go back to Adobe Bridge and it's gonna show me the update. So let's take a quick look at this image, which is underexposed based on how it looks and the histogram. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose that masking icon and do select subject again. And it got the guy, this bag, and a little bit of the violin case, which in this case works fine. I'll make him just a little brighter. I'll open up his shadows just a touch more and tweak the blacks just a little. And I like what that did. But maybe I want to come up and duplicate that mask and it's going to reapply that effect by double, right? So now I've turned up the volume on my radio by 200%, which I don't want. But essentially this is for the background. So I'm just going to invert that mask. So now the background has been brightened, but I don't want the background that bright. Instead on, on the background, I'm going to open up the shadows a lot and pull up the saturation a lot, and then just tweak the background until it complements my subject. So yeah, I think I think that's a really nice complement. And remember, you can always come back to this one and brighten it a little more in relation to what you just made. So do you see how I can quickly give him a, a little bit more pop and zest, but he still stands out? Now, what about this? Let's go back to that quick mask selection and choose color range. Now maybe I wanna select this area right here and say, hey, I'd like to change all of this green in this area. Now notice it selected green almost everywhere. So maybe here I would, I would select the subtract tool and say, you know, I don't want it to select everything. So I'll make a huge brush and I'll just paint off everything except that green. So obviously there's green light hitting all of this stuff. And let's see how easily I can shift the hue of that bag. Maybe I can shift it to there. Maybe I can make it a little darker, pull the shadows down a little bit, pull the highlights down just a little bit. Then I can do my normal stuff, go back to the basic panel and say, you know, this is a great one for some dehaze. And while we're here, let's go back up to that mask and this time do a radial gradient. Why? Because maybe we want a spotlight right on him, just click and drag, put a spotlight on him, maybe make it a little taller, pull it down, and just say, make him just pop a little, pull down the highlights, right? Probably popped him a little much, and let's lower the contrast just a touch, and click done, and then let's look at it before. So I'm gonna click on this, and then I'm gonna click on the before and the after, before and after. If I wanna see them side by side, just click on this to cycle between. So now I can see where we started. Now I can see I've, I've made it a lot richer, made it appropriately bright, especially on him. I've shifted the color of that green and I did all of this within Adobe Camera Raw very quickly. 
So this video is about the new presets added to Adobe Camera Raw. I'm going to show you where they are, how to use them, how to apply multiple presets on top of each other, and most importantly, how to create and save your own. Let's get to it. So Camera Raw has added about 70 new premium presets. Let's go over there. I'm gonna select both of these, and I'm gonna click this little aperture icon, which is gonna open these JPEG files in Camera Raw. So if you come over to the far right side and click on this, this is your preset menu. And remember, Adobe Camera Raw has the exact same develop functionality as Lightroom. Adobe has said it's like having two different color cars with the exact same engine in them. Everything that drives Adobe Camera Raw, they're the same exact algorithms that drive Lightroom. So Lightroom has had presets forever. Now they finally added a lot of them, a lot of good ones into Adobe Camera Raw, though they have had some presets before in the past. Before it was just like color and creative and black and white and portraits. But now look at all these different styles. We have portrait presets for deep skin, medium skin, light skin. We have auto retro, black and white, cinematic one and two, futuristic, vintage. We have presets for food. We have presets for landscape. And here's how you use them. Let me click on cinematic and I'm just hovering. It's a great place to start your editing. I like that one. At CN16, I can favorite it by putting a star right here and it will add it to my favorites. So I can just always click it to apply it. This way, if I had 10 images open up in Adobe Camera Raw, I could just click the next one or I could select all of them with a shift key and just click that same preset and it will apply. Then I can click done. Then it goes right back to Adobe Bridge. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select these, go down to develop settings and I'm gonna say clear settings. So what I want you to pretend is, pretend I only had that creative style applied to this image. Let me go back and do it. It's gonna save the last thing I did. See, CN16. Now here's the thing to think about. What if I had 100 images that I'd pre-selected, I've kind of edited down and I said, okay, all I have to do is select those images in this folder by hitting Command A. I only have one other image here, but I could easily have a hundred or a thousand. It doesn't matter. And then all I do is right click, go down to develop settings, and I could either do previous conversion or I could also just hit CN16. And it would apply that preset, that special color and tonal toning to the entire image. Again, whether it's 10, 100, or a thousand, it'll update automatically. So let me show you another application. So let's say I, I go back in, I can either hit Command or Control R or click on this little aperture icon. It'll open up in Bridges version of Camera Raw. I'll come over to this preset panel and let's say I went into Portraits Light Skin and I come all the way down to PL11 and, and I click it to apply it officially. Not like, so it's not just a hover over thing. And it's like, you know, I really like that, but I, I'd like it to be more faded. So I can just drag this PL11 intensity slider to make it more faded. I could drag it the other way to make it more intense. But no, I think more faded would be more appropriate for this particular one. Now watch this. I can then go into vintage. And then, because I've already applied one of the other presets, I can now apply another preset on top of it. So here I think I'm going to apply this preset as well and figure out do I want more or less. I think it's right about the right place automatically. And then I'm just going to click done. By clicking done, it closes it and takes me back to bridge. If I clicked open, it would open it in Photoshop. So now I have two presets applied to this. And we have an indication in the upper right hand corner that I've applied something in Adobe Camera Raw. And remember, if I have 10 images in this folder, 100 images, 1000 images, it really doesn't matter. I can select them all, right click, go down to develop settings, and then I would just say, apply previous conversion. The reason I'm not going to apply this single CN16 is because I had two adjusted presets applied. So I'm just going to apply the previous conversion and it would apply it instantly across all of the images that needed to have the exact same look so that if I'm putting them up on a website or printing them, they're visually consistent in both color and tone. So now you're thinking, okay, what if I come up with my favorite preset, right? but it's not showing up down here, but I've gone on and done different things. So I would have lost this previous conversion memory. It's still not a big deal. All you would do is open this back up in Camera Raw and it has all of these things still applied, right? So all you would do is come over to this more icon. The more icon is designated by the three dots. This is more image settings. You'd click it and you would say, I love this preset so much that I want to create my own preset, which is a combination of all these other ACR presets. And you would just, my faded vintage. 
and it would be saved into the group user presets. I could create a new group if I wanted to, and I can check all the things that I want to be applied. I can add things like auto tone or auto black and white mix. So you have a lot of options and just click OK. So now under the user presets, I have this My Faded Vintage. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click Done. I'm gonna select both of these, right click, and I'm gonna say Clear All the Settings. So now when I select an image and go back over to ACR into the preset panel, I can just look at my user presets and there's my faded vintage and I can apply it, click done. And then I can go back and select that one or a thousand images. And then I can do develop settings, previous conversion. And it's going to apply that to every single image in that folder. How amazing is that? Bang, bang, baby. It's a new day. Hey, if you like this video, it helps. You can help me smack it, whack it and crack a lack it. Take care. I like subscribers. That's awesome. Whoa! Yes! <laughs> oh my god, I did! This is hey, you stayed to the end. You know what that means. You're awesome. I'm talking about you. Now get out of here.